Okay, now last week, if you remember, we saw that the, uh, the Corinthians, they got corrected yet again. Um, this time it was for, they were taking each other to court. Um, they, they weren't judging matters as they should have between themselves. And, and obviously we saw that that wasn't, you know, when something, you know, there's a genuine crime going on, that's something that should be given to the authorities to handle. You know, we're not saying that things should be swept under the carpet and covered up. Um, you know, that's what the authorities are there for. You know, didn't turn there, but in Romans chapter 13, verse 4, it says, for speaking about the authorities, it says, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So, you know, we can't ignore that. We can't ignore the fact that, that one of the things governments are there for are to punish evildoers. Now, obviously, sadly, in the day that we live in, evildoers commit their evil, and where's the punishment? It doesn't seem to be coming. You know, they might, you know, we'll put them up in the Milton Hilton for a few months, for a few years, and then we'll let them out. You know, we'll pay, is it like $100,000 a year it costs to house them in there, and then they come out. And we're talking about, you know, murderers and rapists and all these sorts of, that's what happens. Pedophiles, that's what happens. And yet, according to the Bible, you know, he's supposed to be, he's not bearing the sword in vain. In other words, the sword is supposed to be put to use. Um... But of course, instead, our government today, that's not what they're into. They'd rather spend their time telling you, you know, how to be healthy and, you know, how to wear a mask and how to wash your hands and wipe your bottom and all that sort of stuff. That's what they seem to be concerned about, which is really, frankly, it's none of their business. It's none of their business. But, um, you know, don't forget what the government is, is supposed to be do- doing. But what Paul's saying here is in the smaller matters in the church, things that aren't crimes, things that aren't serious issues, it's like, you know, these smaller matters, maybe owing people money or, or things like that. They should be judged within the church, you know. First of all, just one to one, you know. If, if it's a serious, you know, issue, you, you maybe take someone with you or bring it towards the whole church after you've gone through those very steps. That's what's supposed to happen. And um, then we saw the last part of the chapter. The big focus was on fornication, fornication, and how serious it is. Fornication is a very serious sin. It's very serious. It's very dangerous. And in this chapter, we're actually going to start out kind of continuing on on the same thought. Look at verse number 1 of chapter number 7. 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 1, it says, Now concerning the things of you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now it's interesting, he says here, look, concerning things of you wrote unto me. You see, this is 1 Corinthians. But this is not the only contact that Paul had with the Corinthians. He actually had other contact with them. And since, obviously, you know, he'd been there and preached to them, preached the gospel, they'd call on the Lord, that sort of stuff. But, you know, they'd actually written to him. Look, it says, now concerning the things, Rob, ye wrote unto me. So guess what? There's First Corinthians, a letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. But guess what? There's also you know, a letter that, that they wrote to Paul. You know, now we don't have record of what that was, but obviously some of what Paul's saying is actually answering their questions. But not only that, Paul had previously written to them. Look back at chapter number 5 again. Chapter number 5 and verse number 9, it says... I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Notice that. Paul's already written to them in a letter to say don't hang around with fornicators. It seems to be a common theme. But you see, we, the, the apostles, the prophets, they wrote and they spoke many things. They spoke a lot of things. But the things which we've got recorded in Scripture, those are the things that were inspired by God. You see, Paul's earlier letter to the Corinthians that wasn't inspired by God. And I'm sure there was a lot of godly advice and all that sort of stuff from, from an apostle. But it wasn't scripture. It's not something we need. It's not like, oh, we, we really need to have three letters to the Corinthians or four letters. To, we, that's where we know. If God has given us everything that we need. There's nothing that, you know, that we need that he hasn't given us. It says in um, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's proper for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So according to the Bible, we've got what we need. We've got what we need to be complete. Everything that we need, we've got there in the Scriptures. And we understand when we look at the Scriptures, these are not Paul's words that we're looking at. You know, what does Peter say in 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse number 21? He says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So when Paul was speaking, and you know, who was, was writing it down, you know, sometimes you know, Tertius, I think, for example, wrote the, the, the epistle to the Romans. Tertius was the one who wrote it down, but Paul spoke it. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. There's many other examples of that. Look, if you look at Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 18. Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 18. And this is Peter speaking. In Acts chapter 1 and verse number 18, he says... Uh, excuse me, verse 16, not 18. It says, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost 
by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them who took Jesus. He's saying, look, there was, a, there was a scripture that was spoken before, and it was spoken, who by? By the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost spoke it by the mouth of David. In other words, he used the prophet David. We see the same thing at the end of the book of Acts. Look at Acts chapter number 28. Acts chapter number 28 and verse number 25. Acts chapter number 28 and verse number 25. It says, And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. So what that's saying is when Isaiah spoke, when he, you know, and obviously he spoke and it was written down, that was the Holy Ghost who was speaking. It was the Holy Ghost who was speaking. Now, if we ever look back here at um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, he says here, Concerning things Rob, you wrote unto me, he says, It is good for a man not to touch a woman. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Let's say, look, it's, guess what? It's good for men and women to keep their hands off each other. That's what I'm saying. It's good for men and women to keep their hands off each other. I mean, I've been to churches before where it's all very touchy-feely. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of hugging going on. Okay? Everyone hugs each other all the time. You know? and, and, and here's the thing. That can be really inappropriate. You know? It can make people feel uncomfortable. You know, I mean, I, I'm not maybe it's because I'm English or something. I've never sort of really been a sort of huggy sort of a person. But I, I know my wife talked to me about how she, there was certain there were certain particular people at this church that we used to go to, and this was this is way this wasn't even a Baptist church. And um, but there were people that were just they kind of creeped her out. Yeah. You know, and they'd always want to come and try and give her a hug because it's like, that's what people do in these sort of, and it's like it's just it's just a bit yeah it's it's it's, it's not it's not a good thing. And the Bible actually says, look, it's in a, you know inappropriate. It's, but I suppose, to be fair, we do need to have a balance. Because I'm not saying, when the Bible says it's good for a man not to touch a woman, this is not saying, it's not a blanket ban on ever touching someone of the opposite gender. Because so I've heard people go down that path, this, this, should ne- this should never happen. You know, if a woman you know, was trying to get, you know, maybe she's grieving, and it's, you know, you've just got to step aside and just shake a hand. No, that's, that's not saying that. You know? I mean, I, I have given someone a hug before. You know, in this church. My wife has given people hugs before in this church. But it's not in the regular circumstance. You know, you don't get your, your daily hug or your weekly hug whenever you come in from us, do you? That's not what happens. Or maybe if you're a lady, you do it from my wife or whatever. But, but that, that's not the way it's supposed to be, okay? But in, cir- in exceptional circumstances, things that aren't the norm, it says, look, it is good not to do something. But that doesn't mean that it's always a sin if someone does do it. Just because it's good not to do something, you know, I mean, so so we do have to have a balance in there. But look what he says in verse number two. He says, look, so it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So it's good to keep your hands off each other. But in order to avoid fornication, what does the Bible say to do? Get married. Get married. Because then when you get married, you can touch someone as much as you want to. You know, and notice also, notice it's a one to one relationship. Let every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband. It's not husbands or wives, it's a one to one relationship. You know, now it's true that most people in the, in the sort of Western world, if you like, they don't, they don't practice polygamy. We don't have multiple wives or multiple husbands or stuff like that. Now, it's still fine in, in the Muslim world. The Muslim world thinks that polygamy is fine. But here's the thing in our country, people will do a different sort of thing. What they'll do is they'll have a succession of partners. So they might not have, you know, four or five wives at the same time, but they'll just have one and then another and then another and then another. I mean, look at um, look at First Thessalonians chapter number four. First Thessalonians chapter number four. And obviously, you know, we're familiar with people who do they get married lots of times. But a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll just have they'll go through lots of relationships before they get married. You know, they'll go through relationship after relationship after relationship. Look at First Thessalonians chapter number four. First Thessalonians chapter number four and verse number one. Paul says, "Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren." We beseech you and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk in to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Understand, these were commandments that were given. Commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. A lot of people say, what's God's will? If only I could know God's will for my life. We well, look, here it is right here. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. That's what God's will is. That you abstain from fornication. That every one of you, not some of you, 
Every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. It's talking about keeping yourself clean, keeping yourself pure. He says, look, not on the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. He says, we shouldn't behave, be behaving the same way as the world behaves. See, that's what the world does. They just go after girlfriend after girlfriend after girlfriend, boyfriend after boyfriend after boyfriend. That's what the world does. We shouldn't be like that. We shouldn't be like that at all. He says, look, that no man go beyond, this is interesting, and defraud his brother in any matter. Defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we ought to have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. God says, look, don't be unclean, but be holy. That's what God says. Don't be unholy, don't be unclean, but be holy and be clean. And those who talked about going beyond and defraud it, why would there be, why would there be a sense of fraud going on. Because, you know, when people go through lots of relationships, do you know what they do is they carry baggage from those previous relationships. They carry baggage. Because the Bible says when, when two come together, those two should be one flesh. In fact, didn't even talk about it in the, in the previous chapter about when someone's joined to an harlot. Yeah, it says, No, you're not, that he which is joined to an harlot is one body. For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. That's a very close, intimate relationship. And that's... That's not something that you should be doing with someone that you're not married to. And here's the thing. The reason we should, one of the reasons we should be keeping ourselves clean and pure is because our virginity belongs, or your virginity belongs to your future spouse. So if you give it away to someone else, what's that done to your future spouse? You know, the wife or the husband that you end up having. Guess what? You've taken something that belongs to them, you gave it away to someone else. What have you done? You've defrauded them. You've defrauded them. Not only that, what about the person that your ex-girlfriend or your ex-boyfriend ends up getting married to? Guess what? Well, they're not a virgin either. So that means you've defrauded their future husband or their future wife. You've stolen something from them that doesn't belong to you. That's something the Bible uses very strong terms. He says defraud, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Look, if you go to John chapter number 4, John chapter number 4, John chapter number 4 and verse number 5, John chapter number 4, in verse number 5, I mean, here's a, this, is a, this is a common example that we see. John chapter number 4, in verse number 5, it says, <clears throat> Then cometh he, this is Jesus, cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank of himself and his children and his, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drink of the water that, I, that sorry, whosoever drink of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But that the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water spring up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. So you know what There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. People think that the world we live in today is different than what was in the past. No, the Bible says there's no new thing under the sun. Here's the woman, what? She's had five husbands, and guess what? The guy that she's shacking up with a minute, it's not her husband. According to Jesus, not her husband. Look back at 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 3, it says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. What that's saying is, husbands and wives should be good and kind to each other. They should be kind. I mean, the word, you know, benevolence, it's not a word we use a huge amount. You might have heard someone talk about, think about like a, a benevolent ruler, a benevolent king or something. What does that mean? It's when someone, you know, they're good and they're kind. That's what it's talking about, when someone is good and someone is kind. And guess what? That's what it should be like in the relationship between a husband and wife. Look at Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 25. Ephesians chapter number 5 
And verse number 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. You know, we're all familiar with the Bible says you're supposed to, you know, what's the greatest commandment? You know, love the Lord thy God with the heart, mind, soul, and strength. But it says, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, guess what? What about your wife? What about your wife? So it meant to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. It's okay to love yourself. It's okay to treat yourself well. It's okay. Some people, they, they think down about themselves. They, they say, oh, I'm just worthless. And, and it's true that the Bible says we're all sinners. That's true. But at the same time, God doesn't want us to, you know, I mean, if you had someone and you thought really scummily of them, how would you treat them? Not very well. Well, guess what? If that's what you think of yourself, you won't treat yourself very well either. And, you know, when people get treated really badly, does that sort of respond, you know, do they respond really well to that? Or does it make them sad? Does it make them bitter? Does it make them depressed? You know, treat, you should treat yourself like someone that you care about. Treat yourself like someone that you care about, because you should. It's natural and normal. He says, look, you're supposed to. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. You know? Jesus said, love thy neighbour as thyself. Well, oh, yeah, I love my neighbour, but I hate myself. I'm worthless. Worthless. No, you should love your neighbour as you love yourself, according to the Bible. But not only that, it's like, lay, love your neighbour, love yourself. Look down at verse number 33. Nevertheless, did everyone you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. I mean, treat her husband with respect. Now, some people say, oh, yeah, that's what's supposed to happen. Husband's supposed to love the wife, but the wife is supposed to just reverence the husband. Well, no, actually, it actually goes both ways. If you look across at Titus chapter number 2, Titus chapter number 2 and verse number 4, Titus chapter number 2 and verse number 4, it says they may, that they may teach the young woman to be sober. I'm in the wrong book. To be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. That's what the old woman is supposed to teach the young woman. Teach the young woman to be sober. That's a great idea. But to love their husbands, to love their children. To be discreet, chaste, keep us at home. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Last place we'll look is in Colossians chapter number 3 and verse number 18. Colossians chapter number 3 just in this particular verse we're looking at, Colossians chapter number 3, and verse number 18, it says, Husbands, love your wives, if I could find the page, and be not bitter against them. Verse number 18. Oh, sorry, verse 19, excuse me. Verse 19. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. It's important that husband and wives, they treat each other well, that they love each other, they be kind to each other, that they think well of each other. Look back at 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7 and verse number 4. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse number 4. It says, The wife hath not power over, of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except to be with consent for a time. Then may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. You see, when you get married, according to the Bible, your body now belongs to your spouse. According to the Bible, what that means is withholding your body from your spouse is actually fraud. That's why it says, defraud ye not one the other. Just like giving away your virginity that we saw back in, in Thessalonians with fornication, guess what? That's, that's fraud. But this here is also, this is defrauding. You see, according to the Bible, consent is something that you're only supposed to, it's only supposed to be something that needs to be sought in order to abstain from marital intimacy. Not in order to engage in it. You see, the world will say, you know, You've got to have consent. That's what it's all about. Well, that's all the Bible actually says. That's all the Bible actually says. It says, you know, I mean, I've heard plenty of, to be honest, I've heard plenty of fundamental preaching talking about, like, don't defraud your spouse and emphasizing over and over again it's your duty as a married person. But we need to have to balance and realize that, look, we're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to be good. We're supposed to be kind to one another. And so that means that if there's a problem in marriage, you shouldn't just say, well, well, look, this is what the Bible says, and so you just need to submit yourself. You just need to... No, you're supposed to love your spouse. You're supposed to treat them with respect. You're supposed to give honour unto them. In fact, actually, look at um, 1 Peter chapter number 3. 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 6. 1 Peter chapter number six, uh, 3, excuse me, uh, and look at verse number, verse number 6. 
See, there's even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling the Lord whose daughters you are, as long as you do well and not afraid with any amazement. See, Sarah obeyed Abraham. There's a lot of people who like to say, oh yeah, you must submit. Wives is to submit themselves to your husband. It's true. The Bible does have lots of verses saying, wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. But we need to keep reading. Because it says in verse number 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honour, notice that, giving honour unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So notice, he says, look, you're supposed to, a husband is supposed to dwell with his wife with knowledge, giving honour to her. Understand that she is the weaker vessel, and because if you don't give honour to her, then guess what? Your prayers are going to be hindered. Do you want your prayers to be hindered? Great way to have your prayers hindered, don't treat your wife the way you should. If you don't treat the wife the way, your wife the way you should, your prayers will be hindered. Why? Because the Bible says, look, you know, whosoever turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer should be abomination. You see, if you ignore what God says and think, well, I'm just going to do it my way, well, guess what? God's going to, and it's not that he doesn't hear you, he still hears you, but he's just not going to pay attention. He's not going to answer your prayers. And, and then it says, look, finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Look, well, look, this is just talking about with brotherly love. Well, guess what? Well, shouldn't it be even greater between a husband and a wife? Love as brethren. Be pitiful. That means be filled with pity. Be pitiful. Be pitiful. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering. Look at this. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. See, guess what? That means if your husband or your wife does something bad to you, treats you bad, says bad things to you, says, look, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. But contrarywise, blessing. Knowing that you're there unto called that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days. Do you love life? Do you want to see good days? Well, how about this? Refrain his tongue from evil and his lips, lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil. That means stay away from evil. Eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. You see, you can't escape from God's gaze. We think we can. We think we can get away with it, but we can't. You can't escape. You know, the Bible says, beware your sin will find you out. Beware your sin will find you out. God knows what you're doing, and guess what? You know, God's going to pay. The Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. What are you sowing? Think about what you're sowing. You know, young sowing good things, and, hey, rejoice because good things are coming. But if you're sowing evil, if you're sowing bad things, beware, beware. Look back at 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. You see, according to the Bible, abstaining from intimacy within marriage is not something that you should do. I mean, what well, it says you can abstain for a time. It says, um, accept it with consent. For a time, you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Then come together again that Satan tempt you not for your unconscious incontinency, and it's like incontinence, like lack, lack of self-control. So, it's something you shouldn't do for a big length of time, because why? It, it says, you know, maybe for a time when you're specifically praying and fasting. But, like, you know, so how long do you fast for? One day? Two days? Three days? A week? Maybe? You know? So, think about it. That, that, that's the comparison that's going on. It's not, it's not some big, long length of time. And it says, and then come together, that you're not tempted. Because that's one of the reasons why getting married can help avoid getting into fornication. That's the whole thing. It says, look, that to avoid fornication, get married. But then one of the reasons is because, you know, this is what happens. Then all of a sudden, husband and wife, they, they have each other's bodies. Look at verse number six. He says, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. You see, the instructions that Paul has given here to say, look, to avoid fornication, get married. He's saying, this is not a command. This is not a command. If you want to stay single, that's, that's fine. It's absolutely fine to be single. Paul was single. Now, obviously we want to balance this. Don't forget that God himself said in Genesis 2.28, it's not good that man should be alone. It's not good that man should be alone. There are many blessings in being married. It's a, it's a great thing. Um, but there is that balance, you know. It says, look, it's, 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 this is not a commandment. It's a, it's a people have freedom in this area. Look at verse number 7. For I would, this is what Paul thinks, for I would that all men were even as I myself. 
But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, and another after that. You see, some people have the gift. Some people have the ability to say, stay single throughout their life. But to be honest, most people don't have that gift. That was a gift that Paul had. The particular people that have that gift. Maybe you have that gift. Maybe you don't. Look at verse number 8. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. So what he's saying is, look, if you've never married, if you've never married, or maybe, you know, if your spouse has died, it's perfectly okay to stay single like Paul was. Don't think that you have to get married. Now, if you want to, that's fine, but don't think that you have to get married. But he's not saying that everyone, or even most people, should take that option. You know, we don't all have that gift. I mean, think about what would happen if we, we all had the gift of Paul have not getting married. I mean, what would happen to the, you know, the next generation? <laughs> Where would they be? You know what I mean? It would, it, would, it, would have a, it would have a huge impact, you know? And not only that, I mean, think back once again to Genesis. What did God say back in Genesis? What did he tell Adam and Eve? Be fruitful and multiply. What did he tell Noah when he got off the ark? Be fruitful and multiply. You know? That's, that's God's, God's desire. Now, once again, it's not that that has to be, you might be that special Apostle Paul. But, you know, not always. There's not that many Apostle Pauls. Look at verse number 9. It says, But if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to boom. You see, if you find that you're really desiring to be with someone, then guess what you should do? You should get married. Rather than, you know, burning with lust. That's, that's not something you should be doing. That's why. To avoid fornication. Because, you know, over time, you know, if you're lusting, if you're desiring to be in this situation, you know, you need an outlet for that. And so, the best thing, the Bible says, is, is get married. Look at verse number 10. It says, And unto the married I command, Yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. And so now he's changing the audience that he's talking to. Before he was talking to the, the unmarried people, now he's talking to the married. And he says to them, This is not just opinion. This is not just opinion. He says, look, unto the married I command, yet not I. So he says, I'm commanding you, but it's not really me, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. So he says, look, this is not just my, my view. This is God's commandment. He says, look, wives don't leave your husbands. Do not leave your husbands. Now, obviously, the opposite is also true. The opposite is also true. Why would this be? Look at Matthew, Mal Malachi chapter number 2. Malachi chapter number 2 and verse number 14. Last book of the Old Testament, just before Matthew, you've got Malachi. Malachi chapter number 2 and verse number 14. It says, Ye ye say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. A covenant is like an agreement or a promise. And did not he make one? Yet had he the res residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? Why did he make the two one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, and saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. So what does the Bible say? The God of Israel saith he hated putting away. God hates divorce. He hates it when a husband puts away his wife, when a wife puts away her husband. God hates divorce. Look back at verse number 11 of 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 11. He says, look, let not the wife depart from her husband, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. So yeah, we see it does go both ways. Now, here's the thing. If someone does separate from their spouse, what should they do? They should remain unmarried or get reconciled with them. That's what should happen. Now, this isn't true in all cases. Keep your finger there in 1 Corinthians 7 and look at Deuteronomy. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 24. Deuteronomy chapter number 24. Okay, now, th there is a... There is a strange teaching out there that, um, I don't know if you've heard of this one, where people will teach that, look, that you're still married to someone even when 
they leave you and get married to someone else. You ever heard that teaching? I think people, I think it's like covenant keepers or something like that. I knew this lady who was into that one time over in, over in Australia, and she was, um, yeah, she'd been, she'd been married, and her husband had left her and gone off and married someone else, and she was like, no, no, I'm believing God that we're still married in God's eyes, and it's this, this covenant keepers thing. And um, it's quite, it was a bizarre thing. I mean, she's actually now married a priest or someone like that, or an ex-priest or something strange. But anyway, you know, when someone gets married again, they're actually married again. Because didn't we see that in John chapter number four? What did Jesus say to that woman? He said, thou hast had five husbands. How many husbands has she had? She had five. No, but she didn't, didn't she just have one and she just she was still married? It didn't matter because you know, she's still married to that one and those other ones. No, Jesus said she had five husbands. So clearly she got married again and they were her husband. There's another sort of bizarre teaching that says that you know when people live together, that, that, that makes them married in God's eyes. You've heard that one. People are, you know, people are shacking up that, oh, they're married in God's eyes. Well, guess what? Jesus debunked that idea too, didn't he? He debunked that one because what did he say? He whom thou now hast is not thy husband. So you've had five husbands, and the one you've got currently, he's not your husband. So she's on to number six. But just living together, that doesn't make him her husband. Just because you're living with someone, you're sleeping with someone, you might even have children together. You might have been living with them for years. You still aren't married. You know, it's kind of like, I saw this thing, this was like a documentary or something like that. Was a, you know, there's a, you heard about people getting, being chucked out of Australia. They throw out all the New Zealand convicts and stuff like that. And, and, and some of the stuff they do, you know, like if, if someone commits a crime, and there was some guy, I think, it was at, I think it was probably domestic violence or something, he'd beaten up his partner or something, he was in prison. And so when he came out of prison, they said, push off, we don't want your sword in Australia. And they shipped him back to New Zealand. I think Jacinda wasn't very happy about it, but shipped him back here. But he'd, he'd been in this relationship, he had children, he had a job, he had all these sorts of things, and they shipped him back here. And the problem was, he'd been over there for like 20 or 30 years, he'd never bothered to get Australian citizenship. He'd never become a citizen. And so there was time, well, no, you know, we're, we're, we're cutting down who we're spending money on, off you go. You know, there's a difference between someone who's a citizen and someone who's not a citizen. Citizen. Well, guess what? There's a difference between someone who's married and someone who's not married. There is a difference. What's the difference? Well, look, in one case, a promise has been made. That's the difference between living with someone versus being married. A promise has been made to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, and what does it say? Till death do us part. That's a promise. But guess what? In the other case, when you're just shacking up with someone, the promise hasn't been made. There's no covenant. There's no agreement. You're there in Deuteronomy chapter number 24. Deuteronomy chapter number 24. It says in Deuteronomy chapter number 24, it says, verse 1, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favour in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she has departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled. For that is abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, for an inheritance. So here's an interesting thing. According to the Bible... Reconciliation. So if, if your husband or your wife has departed, okay, you can be reconciled, but there are times when you can't be reconciled. And one of the times is, guess what? If there's been a divorce and you've got married to someone else. If there's been a divorce and you've got married to someone else, then that means that you actually can't. It can only happen before someone gets married. After that, it's too late. Why is it too late after that? You know, why is it that if someone got married again, and then that, that husband died or wife died, why couldn't they marry their previous spouse again? Because God said so. That's why. Because God said so. Now, it's interesting, this is actually the opposite of what is taught by the God of the Quran. You know, what, what, Muhammad, what Muhammad said in the Quran. According to the Quran, then Allah, he actually commands, when someone gets divorced, when they divorce their wife, he says they can't reconcile, they can't remarry them, unless they first marry someone else. Now that's strange. 
So guess what? You know, they've, they've separated, they've been divorced, and then let's reconcile. Muhammad said, well, no, actually, no, you can't. You've got to go and marry someone else first, and then to get divorced from them, and then you can come back. That makes absolutely no sense at all. It's, and not only that, it's the opposite of what the Bible says. It's the opposite. I mean, just what good is that going to do the marriage? Involving something else in it, involving someone else in it, that's going to do no good whatsoever going forward. Anyway, look back at... Um, and it's also, it's also worth noting here, that look, here we see someone getting a divorce, getting remarried, and then someone else getting divorced. There, are, there is a teaching around that says the only legitimate reason for a divorce, according to the Bible, is for... They say, you know, fornication being like premarital sex or something like that. Something like that has happened. And it's because he's fight, discovered she's defiled. But that doesn't fit because God says, guess what? The first one can divorce and the second one can divorce. And we'll see actually later on what, how that lines up with what Jesus taught. Look back at um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7 and verse number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7 and verse number 12. And don't worry, we're going a bit slow, but I think we'll only mark part, partway through the chapter. Verse number 12. It says, but to the rest speak I. So he's given, this is the command from the Lord. Let her remain, if she depart, let her remain unmarried, be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So Paul now gives his own views, as opposed to just realizing, relaying the known commandments of God. He says, look, if you're married to an unbelieving wife, and they're happy to stay with you, don't get divorced. Don't get divorced. Okay? That's what he says. Look, if, if, you, if, you, if you're married to an unbeliever and they're happy to stay with you, because some people, they might divorce you because like, you've gone and become this crazy religious person. They might. You know, sadly, that sort of thing can happen. Look at verse number um, verse 13. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. You see? So, same thing applies in the opposite situation. Being married to someone who isn't saved is not grounds for divorce. Now, some people will say, look, there is never grounds for divorce. You ever heard people say that? There is never, ever grounds for divorce. Well, what did Jesus say? Look at Matthew, Matthew chapter number 19. Matthew chapter number 19, and verse number 1. Matthew chapter number 19, and while you're turning there, I'll read you from Matthew chapter number 5. It says in Matthew 5, 31, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. This is Jesus speaking. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put his wife away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. You're there in Matthew chapter number 19. Matthew chapter number 19. Look at verse number 1. Matthew 19 verse number 1. It came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came to the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? They're saying, look, can we just divorce our wife for just whatever reason? You know, I don't like the way she cooks. I don't like the way she cleans. You know, she's a nag. You know, she's, just, she's lazy. She sits on the couch all day. You know, this, can we just divorce our wife for whatever cause? And he answered, said unto them, Have ye not read? I love how often Jesus answers that. Have you not read? It's like they're answering, asking questions, saying, look, Shouldn't you know this? Haven't you read this? It's here in the book. Have you not read? That he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Guess what? Leave father and mother, cleave to his wife. You leave your father and mother, you cleave. That means you join. A husband and wife join together. They cleave together, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. See, God has joined you together. And that's what happens when you make a promise in the sight of God when you get married. But that's, what, that's not happening when people are just living together. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command us, command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? You see, they, they, are, they have read something. Moses said, right, huh? guess what? You can write a bill of divorce. You can get divorced. And he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. 
And so he says, look, there is a condition, and that is this condition of fornication. When someone commits fornication, we've gone through it before, how the, the fornication is a broader term. It's not just sex before marriage. That's not what it is. Fornication encompasses married people as well. Okay, that's why early, in fact, we saw it in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Remember the guy who, what, there was fornication among you, and such as not named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's what? Wife. And it's called fornication. You know, Jezebel in Revelation chapter number 2 commits fornication and commits adultery. She's doing both. Um, but he says, look, Moses gave you this because of the hardness of hearts. You see, I, am I saying that because, you know, a spouse has committed fornication, you must divorce them? No. You could forgive. You could forgive. God forgave. Think how much God has forgiven us. We can forgive. But that, that option is still there. You know, I mean, think about the person who's, you know, who's married and then, the, and then they discover they're, they're married to, you know, their, their spouse is out, a serial adulterer. Maybe they're, a, maybe they're a pedophile, maybe there are all sorts of manner of evil, which is, well, it's frowned upon in the world, but right, it's not really that bad. And you're stuck with them. You're stuck with them. But according to, according to the Bible, look, if they're committing fornication, you have that option. Now, it's not that you have to take that option. It's not that it's forced upon you. You can choose to forgive. But at the same time, you know, God, the Bible says, come let us reason together, saith the Lord. God is a reasonable God. You know, I, I know people who, who honestly believe that they could, they, you know, their, their, their husband could be the serial adulterer, adulterer. They're out there sleeping with prostitutes. And they honestly believe that God's will is that you've got to stay with them. You have to stay with them. You've got to submit yourself to them. You've got to, that, that's what they teach from the Bible. They say exactly that. Well, I don't think that lines up with what the Bible says at all. It doesn't. He says, look, whosoever shall put away his wife, except to be for fornication, shall marry now. See, some people say, look, well, you're making an exception. that You can get divorced in some cases. Well, the same people that say that, they have an exception too. Now, it's just a smaller exception, but it's still an exception. His disciples said unto him, look, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. Say, look, well, if we can't just can't divorce our wives because we don't like them and the cooking sucks and she's nasty and whatever, and I mean, if we can't, maybe it's better not to marry. And he said unto them, all men cannot receive the saying, save they to whom it is given. Remember, not everybody has this gift. Some people do. He says, look, for there are some eunuchs which are so born of their mother's womb, there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. There are people that have made that choice. You know, and some it wasn't you know, made consciously, it was made for them. Anyway, let's get back to 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 10, chapter number 7. You see, why was Paul telling them not to split up with their husband or wife? Because they're an unbeliever. Why was it? Look back at verse number 14. It says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. You see, God can put a special blessing. It's, it's not the ideal situation to be in, being married to an unbeliever. It's not. That's why, that's why it's, it's one of the things, you know, in fact, I think it says at the very end of the chapter, we won't, definitely won't get there, but it says, look, um, Verse number 31, 9. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Only in the Lord. Marry a believer. You know, that's, that's who you should get married to. So then you don't end up in that. The Bible says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? You know, Christ and Beale and all that sort of stuff. No. Don't be unequally yoked. Don't join up. Don't join with someone who's going in a different direction. You know, it's like you've got a horse and a cart or a couple of horses, you know, and you're trying to gallop along, you know. But if one horse is trying to go that way and one's trying to go that way, it's not going to be good. That's why you want to be with someone who's going in the same direction, who has the same goals, who has the same purpose in life. Loving God, serving Him. Otherwise, it's going to lead to all sorts of conflict. But it can happen. You know, sometimes people get married and they get saved after they've got married. That can happen. Well, what can happen is, look, God can put a special blessing on the husband or wife of a believer. God can use them in the lives of their children, even if they aren't saved. 
Because God's ways are the best ways. You see, God's ways are the best ways. You know, it's interesting. Politicians, you know, we've got an election coming up not too far away. And politicians like to make a lot of noise about things like poverty. Isn't there a big thing to talk about? Talk about poverty. Poverty is undoubtedly a bad thing. But, you know, given the fact that governments are notoriously bad at getting out of debt, do you think they're really going to help out with poverty? You know, they're in massive debt themselves. In New Zealand, I think at the end of 2019, New Zealand was $57 billion in debt. But we're projected by the end of 2024 to be $200 billion in debt. Like, practically tripling, quadrupling. You know? But here's the thing. According to statistics, the statistics actually, you, you said you don't want to be in poverty? Here's a good, good way to get out of it. Stats show that finish high school, work full time, and get married before you have children. Then the chance of you being in poverty are very, they're minuscule. Absolutely minuscule. And here's the thing. Those are all things that the Bible agrees with. Getting an education, being able to read. How many times did Jesus say, have you not read? Have you not read? Get yourself a clue. The Bible promotes wisdom. The Bible promotes understanding. You know? The Bible promotes working. The Bible says, if any will not work, neither should he eat. You know, the Bible says we should learn. We should read. We should work. And of course the Bible says, avoid fornication by getting married. Hebrews 13 says, Marriage is honourable all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. One of the things he'll judge a whoremonger with could well be poverty. You know, the lazy person gets judged with poverty. So does the whoremonger. So does the drunk. You know, so does the person. You know, I mean, why is it? I mean, finishing high school, part of that is because how about working at school? You know, if you go to school and you don't work, then you might come out and not be able to read. But those aren't really things that are really massively promoted by our government, or any government. They just don't really, I mean, educate, they, they kind of promote education, but that's because it's sort of more, not the sort of the reading and writing part of it, it's just more the conditioning. Go to our schools and we'll teach you about evolution, we'll teach you, you know, about being a pervert, we'll teach you all those sorts of things. And actually stay in there. That we'll start educating you when you're preschool, they want to get you practically from birth, into daycare, and we can train you all the way up, and then keep going out and go to university. They don't get a job, just, you know, Stay there, we'll teach you more and more. That's what they desire. I mean, do they promote marriage? Is that what they promote? No, they don't. They promote the opposite. They're out there dishing out stuff at schools. You know, to kids, yeah, you know, have safe, safe sex, you know, dish out condoms, all that sort of stuff. They're promoting the opposite. If they were genuinely concerned with poverty, they would be promoting marriage. That's what they'd be doing. They'd be promoting people working hard for a living. You know, learn to read, learn to write, and you want to get a job and work a trade, that's a great thing. We need more of that. But that's not what they promote. And here's the thing. Staying married is of tremendous value to the children. Staying married is of a tremendous value to children. You see, it provides stability, financial stability, a sense of security, a place to belong. You know, when parents split up, it's like, you know, I'm sure some people in this room, they've, they've had spirits blood. Does that give you a sense of security? I don't think it does. Now, am I saying that therefore when that happens, it's just going to destroy your life and it's just going to be a mess? No. Because here's the thing. God can still use you, no matter what situation you've gone through. I mean, likewise, you can be in the ideal situation. Guess what? You can blow it. You can blow the advantages that have been given to you. It's the whole, it's like rags to riches and riches to rags. You know, people can work their way out from abject poverty and be really successful in this life. But people can be also be handed on a silver platter and they can just waste it all and throw it all away. God says, look, he doesn't want. The unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. The unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy? You see, even within a, a marriage where you've got one believer and one unbeliever, God can still protect your children. When you separate, because you think, well, you know, they're an unbeliever, so I don't really want to be with them. Then guess what? That means your kids are with them, and you have a lot less influence. You know, maybe they spend a week here and a week there. That's not 
what's best for the children. You want to be there, with your, whether it's the husband, whether it's the wife, doing everything you can to try and instill godly values into your children. That's what you want to be doing. We might finish up because it's getting on a bit. We started the chapter, remember we, at the start of the chapter, it was yet another warning about fornication. And what do you say? Look, a good marriage is protection against the temptation of fornication. A good marriage, that's the protection against the temptation of fornication and of all the pain and suffering that that leads to. It says in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 22, Proverbs 18 22 says, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favour of the Lord. But here's the thing, being a good husband, being a good wife, that takes time, that takes effort. There are special challenges you will have to overcome if your wife is unsaved, if your husband is unsaved. That's just true. You know, actually last place we turn, look at First Peter chapter number three. First Peter chapter number three, look at that we look sort of further down in the chapter, but look back at um, verse number one of First Peter chapter number three. First Peter chapter number three and verse number one. It says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection unto your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. And we'll get into a little bit um, next week when it talks about how knowest thou whether thou shalt save thy husband or whether thou shalt save thy wife. But it says, Be in subjection to your own, <coughs> own husbands, that if any obey not the word, so this could be an unsaved or a saved husband, they without the word may be won by the conversation of wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of placing the hair, put it, wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy one also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. So this, is like, this is what the wives are supposed to be. But don't forget the husbands. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honour unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren. Love as brethren. The solution to fornication is love. Being in a loving relationship with a husband, with a wife, that will help avoid fornication. Now, for some people, they've given the gift and they're quite happy living a life without being married. But that person, they'll, they'll need love too. They, they'll need to have love for themselves. We all need to have that. We need to have love for ourselves and we need to give that love to other people. Where, do we, where does that love come from? The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. That's where it comes from. The Bible says God is love. And when you're dealing with people, when you're treating with people, whether it's your husband, your wife, your brethren, realise that that person was made by God. That person is loved by God. That person is special to God. And it says, honour one another. Treat one another well. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray you give each one of us a love for one another. Help us to stay clear of the dangers of, of fornication. Help us to put things in place in our life to, to guard ourselves. Help us to think, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think but to think of others as better than ourselves, to, to, to treat others well, whether it's our spouse, whether it's our brethren. Lord, we thank you that you loved us, and we thank you that you gave your life for us. We love you, Lord. Amen.